Aloha, everyone. My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. And on behalf of HHF, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for Pathways to Place, an ethno-historical study of the Maroon Conservancy at Piahi Maui. Today's presentation is being recorded and also live streamed on the HHF YouTube and Facebook pages, and it will be available for viewing immediately after the presentation. For those new to HHF, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places. These are sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. It's my pleasure to introduce Sonnet Kikilia Coggins, the Executive Director of the Merwin Conservancy. Intertwined interests in literature, objects, and stories of place brought Sonnet to the Conservancy in 2018. She completed a master's degree in education at the University of Virginia, and after living in France, completed a Master of Arts in French Language and Literatures with a focus on cultural history and interpretation of historic sites. Sonnet spent her childhood in Virginia making frequent visits to family on Oahu and Kauai. Her family roots in Hawaii date back to her great, 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 great grandmother, I love that, who was born in Lahaina at the turn of the 19th century. Sonnet was part of the first generation on her mother's side to be raised away from Hawaii, and she was happy to return three years ago with her own young family and reestablish roots on Maui. Sonnet will situate us on this land and introduce the Merwin Conservancy, then welcome Kepamali to join her for this evening's conversation. Please use the chat feature on the Zoom menu bar to post your questions throughout and we'll address as many as we can at the end of their discussion. Welcome, Sonnet. Hello. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with everyone today um, and so appreciative of all that you do and all of you've done for this event, Andrea and also Michelle and to my dear colleague, Sarah Tecula, the Director of Programs and Communications, who's also here with us today and will be joining a little bit later in our hour together. And of course, to Kepa and Onauna Mali, thrilled to be with you tonight. I have the really, really good fortune of being among many who care for and tend a very, very special place on the north coast of Maui. This is W.S. Merwin and Paula Merwin's 18 acre palm forest and enchanting home. And I'm just really excited to be able to gather with you and share the story of our efforts over the past year and a half to develop what we're thinking of as a sense of, of our own place literacy. Um, and that to inform our storytelling and to also inform our vision for programs and for partnerships as we grow um, in, in ways that really are gonna engage both communities real close to home here in Hawaii and abroad across the globe. Um, we were so lucky to do this, learn alongside of and learn from Kepa and Onauna over the course of this um, development of this ethno-historical study that we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and it really did, it was a gift from them to us of a very fertile terrain in which to root ourselves. And, and we're doing that too in a very rich and committed legacy of someone who had a deep relationship with place with Hawaii, her language and people, and the Aina. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, one of the things that is has been really thrilling about this whole process has been these multiple occasions to talk story with Kepa, and we'll be doing that a bit later. Uh, so my learning from him will, will continue alongside of all of you. William wrote an essay about his arrival um, on the north coast of Maui in the late 70s. Uh, an essay called The Emergence of a Dream. And something that he wrote in that has always struck me and stuck with me. He said, no story begins at the beginning. The beginning does not belong to knowledge. And I came back to this idea throughout uh, the past year and a half as we were 
thinking about the unfolding story of this place and our contribution to it. Um, certainly, it's, it, it's one of the major takeaways and a theme that you'll hear about is that unfolding story, one that reaches far back beyond um, the reach of our knowledge, and that will continue well into the future uh, with the commitments of the Merwin Conservancy to continue to steward a place so we've been doing a lot of thinking. What does it mean to situate narratives in time? What are the stakes? What are the pitfalls? What do we think about in terms of clarity and accessibility? Um, and I think today I'll begin to orient you um, not so much to time right away. We'll get into that as we discuss, we, we get into speaking, but situating you in place for now to orient you to the Conservancy and our work. I think we have some slides to share. Just a second. Let's see. Andrea, might I um, share slides in a different way? Can you all hear me? Sarah, you should be able to share now. Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. Thank you. So one of the many, many tr brilliant uh, outcomes or shall I say springboards because I don't think it's it's necessarily an outcome but a place to begin again uh, is this trove of material gathered by Kepa and 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 uh, Onana and that includes maps dating from 1873 all the way through 1932 in the course of the research but this particular map just to situate us in places of obviously the island of Maui and at the top, um, I don't have a pointer I can show you, but you can see along the coastline, the, the district of the Moku of Hamakualoa, which is where the Conservancy is located. Uh, we have another, next slide can take you a little closer. Now we've changed our orientation. The Pacific Ocean is there to the left. Um, and you were looking at, oh, I'm sorry, no, the Pacific Ocean is still due north here. But this arrow is pointing to the Ahupua'a, or the land division within the Hamakualoa District, Moku, of Peahi. And this is where the Conservancy is located, and the place where William came to in the late 70s. Um, he was carrying with him the desire to put life back into the earth when so many people were taking life out of it. And he had really developed this, come to this idea uh, while living in France in a small village and really coming to know the relationship, the close relationship that the people in the village there had developed with the land and carried that in his heart, I think, and in, in his kind of view of the world and what was happening in the world throughout the first even five decades of his life. So these are a couple of snapshots of what the land looked like around the time of William's arrival. And we can see the house in the image of the left. So this is really, this is 1987. This is um, eight or so years after his arrival um, and his decision to make a home here and build the house. So on the left, again, you can see the house and to the, to the that's looking um, west. And the image to the right is looking north to the ocean. And this just gives you a little bit of a sense of what uh, life looked like there. It was certainly an area that once thrived with life, ecosystems, communities living along the stream bed, the Peahi stream, and uh, an era of agricultural practices. It cut off the water, and some failed agricultural endeavors had left the land decimated when he found it. So this was really a place to put into practice his desire to continue to put life back into the earth. His intention at that time was to fill in, to, to restore a native forest. What he found there was Christmas berry and guava and invasive species and not a whole lot else. Although you can see by that time in 1987, he's well into planting and around the house, it's, things are starting to change there. Um, but what he found was that he wasn't really able to get a lot of native plants to take, except for the lolu, the prichardia, the native palm, and he followed the palm. He became very interested in palms, 
And here we are, uh, the next slide shows you looking in a similar direction south to that house that you just saw taken very recently in the past few years. Uh, what ended up growing up around his house was uh, a forest or a garden or a wild garden of over 3,000 palms that he planted over the course of four decades. Uh, the house was built prior to that garden building up around him. And you can see from this shot, uh, whereas in the earlier shot, you could see the house and see directly to the ocean. Um, in recent years, of course, the forest has just grown up around and all of the palms are enveloping the house. And so we can no longer see just down to the ocean. This was a house that he designed and helped to build and where he wrote many, many of his poems and his works of um, literature. And again, now these poems are reaching 40 feet up into the air. So this is a place that we're stewarding that's significant in terms of its biodiversity, its botanical diversity, but also as a living work of art, as an expression of the imagination. Um, early on in the, 20, in the early 2000s, as the garden was climbing up around him, he and Paula, his wife, began to think about what would live on after them. And about 2010, the Conservancy was formed in order to steward this place that he so loved and that Paula had so loved well into the future with a conservation easement in partnership with Hawaii Land Trust. Um, and so really just bringing us up to the, the current moment, our custodianship of this place began, the Conservancies, in 2020 coinciding with COVID and uh, really it gave us an opportunity to do some really careful thinking and to turn inward and learn. We learned through an interpretive plan, through, um, through conversations with our, with our community, with four decades worth of documents and books and things we found in the house, through community conversations, oral history interviews, and all the while, the many, many books that are in this house, as you can imagine, there are thousands. And as we went through them, we found lots of stories, again, lots of um, clues as to the kind of commitments and values uh, of a life here in Peahi, including um, many documents. We found several of the land titles dating back. This one's from 1926, so about 100 years, and began to you know, inch our way back in time to think about building a longer term narrative for ourselves of the place we had come to steward. Also among some of the documents we found were letters up in the attic, uh, copies of letters that William had gathered to research the stream diversion. So letters dating to 1866 and forward through the end of the 19th century for him to really understand what the history was from that perspective. So. Um, I think the, the stream diversion was something that really was of interest and captured William's heart and spirit and imagination in a lot of ways. And here's a picture of the stream that now flows, or doesn't flow rather, but that, that runs down the center of the, of the um, Conservancy Garden. And it's a place that inspired a poem. And I thought I'd just share that with you before we um, give you a little glimpse of place and then turn to um, a more fulsome discussion. But William wrote a poem about this very stream bed, and it's called One Valley, and it's from his book, for which he won the Pulitzer, called The Shadow of Sirius, and I'll read it now. One Valley. Once I thought I could find where it began, but that never happened, though I went looking for it time and again, cutting my way past empty pools and dry waterfalls, where my dog ran straight up the stone like an unmoored flame. It seemed that the beginning could not be far then, as I went on through the trees, over the rocks toward the mountain, until I came out in the open and saw no sign of it. Where the roaring torrent raced at one time to carve farther down those high walls in the stone, where the silence that I hear now, day and night, on its way to the sea. So books, notes, letters in the library, stories, 
even stories that uh, came out of the conversations we had in our community constituted a real library of, of information and stories that we could bring forward as custodians. But we began to think of the land itself as a library. And one of our board members, Gabby Holt, who is a library, introduced this idea and this concept to us. And it really captivated our imaginations and helped us really, among other conversations that we had in our interpretive planning process, recognize fully our kuleana to become more literate in this place. And doing our best to live up to the cultural integrity of our founder. And I think the fluency of place that we could say that he found in his time here. So speaking of one garden and, and the, the, the um, flowing, the silence flowing down to the sea, I'd love to give you just a little glimpse to situate us again in place of, of the garden. It's just a three minute clip um, to give you a view of where we're talking about. And it was part of a virtual gathering that we held a few months ago. So you'll see um, the words garden of verses, which is what that refers to. But the first clip will really help to descend us into the place that we're going to be spending some time talking about today. Homecoming. Once only when the summer was nearly over and my own hair had been white as, as the day's clouds for more years than I was counting. I stood by the garden at evening. Paula was still weeding around flowers that opened after dark. And I looked up at the clear sky and saw the new moon. And at that moment, from behind me, a band of dark birds, and then another after, flying in silence, long curving wings hardly moving, the plover just in from the sea, and the flight clear from Alaska, half their weight gone to get them here, but home now, arriving without a sound as it rose to meet me. One of the really uh, wonderful parts of what we found over the past year or so was a few audio recordings of um, an oral history interview that K. Paul Molly conducted with William Merwin in 2012. And what a good fortune that was that day that it brought us back to K. Paul and into conversation to deepen the adventure of learning more about this place. And I, I am daunted by the, the prospect of introducing Kepa and 
and Onauna, they are keepers and tellers of stories themselves for decades. And uh, we've, they've conducted thousands of oral history interviews, developed a repository of information, of resources, and of course an unparalleled um, set of practices, research practices, that have created really rich and accessible historic preservation programs and stories and interpretive frameworks across the islands. Kepa and Onana are part of a husband and wife team in Kumupono Associates, and they've worked together for over 45 years. Um, saying, they say, as they, as in, in their words, they give voice to the land, traditions, and people of Hawaii through ethnographic research, oral history studies, and interpretive education programs. As I mentioned, it's been an incredible privilege to learn from him, um, and I'm really grateful for the resource that he and Onana have created for us as we live into the custodianship of this very special place. So, Kepa, Paul, please, please join us. Hi, aloha mai. Uh, mahalo so much for the opportunity to revisit Peahi and uh, connect with uh, this inspirational program and opportunity. You know, I, I might just start with a beautiful old expression, you know, uh, you know, Kupuna, you know, I, as, as you mentioned earlier, and as we will discuss, you know, the, the aina, the honua ola, the land that which sustains us, the living environment is everything to the Hawaiian people. There was no division between this is natural and that is cultural. And science, by the way, was a part of all of it. Their knowledge, the the that ike kupuna, the traditional knowledge, and so an example of this is just found in the saying that I shared a moment ago. It says, "Oh, the verdant green cliffs, the stream of peahi that runs to the uplands, and the rains that fall so hard they cause one to seek shelter under the puhala." the pandanus trees. And this is an expression describing that beloved aina of kupuna, of the ancestors of those who came before us. And it's carried on through the olelo, the, the sayings, the, the stories, the traditions of families. In some instances, it might even be through the present day, but you know, one of the things that Onauna and I did uh, and this was also, uh, we were so fortunate, Sonat, as you said, that we had the opportunity. We were invited to come and speak with William and Paula uh, in 2012. And we did um, uh, a series of about 14 hours of, of recorded interviews, some of them in the field. Bob Hobby joined us uh, because he's got such a wealth of knowledge in the um, uh, biological communities and, and just, you know, stories of landscape. Um, so we went out and, you know, and uh, spoke about how he came to the Aina. And he recognized that his part of the history was simply a, a pauku, a phrase, a section of a history that, as you pointed out earlier, just goes, you know, it goes to time time in memoriam, you know, just uh, beyond memory. And it will take us into the future. But as when, when William tried to go and find the stream, the headwaters, let's say of Peahi, the landscape has been so radically altered that those headwaters have disappeared in that particular Aupua. But you know, when you think about the name Peahi and that poetry is, is in everything around Hawaiians, uh, it's fascinating. When we, when Onan and I were doing the study, and the idea is to, 
the ethnography is to, to look at the relationship really of people with their living environment, that hunua ola, and to tell those stories and to, to bring, and to renew our awareness of that cultural attachment that everything is alive, everything is connected. What we do today, you know, Kupuna have these beautiful sayings. And while I was growing up on Lanai, Tutu Papa Daniel Kopuiki Sr. had this saying, Maika ikahana akalima, onono kaayakawaha. When the hands do good work, the mouth will have good food to eat. And it's all tied to that kind of idea about malama ponuika aina. Mea care for the living environment, the land, righteously. And the Aina will also care for us in a righteous way. So, you know, when you start to go through these Hawaiian language accounts, we found just unfortunately, you know, so much of the Hawaiian language material is being digitized now. And Onau and I have scanned several hundred thousand records ourselves um, from land records to uh, Christian mission station records to the uh, uh, boundary commission testimonies, you know, we found more than 3,000 references alone to just the word peyahi. And this is, you know, there's a beautiful expression, that the word has the ability to give life or to snatch it away. So for Hawaiians, when they name a place, it's not just because. There is a reason behind it. And while in our research, we were not able to locate one specific account, oh, peai, ke kumui heai kelai noa, peai, the reason it is called by that or known by that name. We didn't find that account, but the name lends itself to so many wonderful possibilities. And this is how place can really inform the myriad art forms that will continue, yeah, through the conservancy's experience. Peahi, to beckon, to wave, to fan, to direct, to point out. Now, but imagine, you know, we see, and during the video, there was, there was the waving, this is gonna get redundant, the waving, the motion of the waves. Now, when you stand on the bluffs, at Peai, looking to there, you see that waving motion. Now you're on the land, and that light breeze blowing off of the ocean creates kamakani o lau niu, kamakani peahi lau niu, the wind which causes the unfurling, the, 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 that uh, gentle nodding of, of the coconut fronds. But even there, you find accounts we know that Kalo was an important product of that Aina and its neighboring Aina because there are other claims of Lo'i, though they're all in Piahi, as far as I am aware, at least in that lower section, they're all gone today because of those historic uses. They also describe, you know, Piahi Mayo Kalo Kalo, the nodding of the Lao Kalo. But it could also be something like the, the kiloi'a, the, the, the head lawai'a, is out there directing from the cliffside and pointing the canoes to where the school of fish, fish might be. You know, so, so there are all of these stories that give us possibilities for understanding. And that's the, one of the beautiful things about the Hawaiian, the living Hawaiian culture and experience. Not all knowledge is found in one school. We can have many different stories depending on who our, uh, where our family is descended from. So anyway, an introduction to the land and to the poetry of place, what we do see is that the Merwin Conservancy is now one of those pauku phrases or paragraphs, a mokuna perhaps, a chapter in this history that predates humanity and may likely post-date us as well, you know? Um, so what, what would you like to chat about real quickly? I, I've tried to set a bit of a foundation in what we've done in gathering this stuff. And let me just, I'm sorry, one other thing. The really cool thing about this study for us personally, Onaunas uh, Kupuna, Kayapa, Smythe, Plunkett, 
were tied right to those Aina as well, particularly as the Hui came together. Her kupuna was one of the kahuna pule at kaulana pueo, at the hale pule at hoelo. You know, so they, they all were connected, these ohana, particularly by that historic period. We go from population of, well, after Western contact, the, the near immediate decline of the native population, the people were far and few scattered in between. And that just, that impact on knowledge and on working the aina and knowing place, it, it was radically changed, yeah? Uh, we lucky that anything has survived the passing of time. So anyway, uh, we, we go and hopefully, uh, as we will even get some questions along the way. Yeah, I love that you entered the current of this conversation with the poetry of, of the language and the place name. And that to me is just a real root. And we'll later on talk about the ways that we're practically folding in these kinds of things that we're discussing and that surface through the work that you did and the conversations we had in our own practice and programming. Um, that's why I just love that we started there. I wonder if it might be uh, helpful to just lay out the sort of bounds of what an ethnohistorical st study is and how you approached it and all the different, the scope is incredible. And I wonder if you might want to just. Sure. This part I'm going to sidestep for just a moment. You may notice behind me the EAEA. -E -E. That EAEA -E 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 is from Hamakuaroa in the upper forest zone. And this at one time grew down to the area near the Merwin property, uh, but it shows you how radically different the landscape is today. Uh, and this EAEA -E -E is one of those sacred plants of the Hawaiian landscape, the embodiment of lauka EAEA, -E -E, la -E -E kawaii, uh, you know, beautiful meta. Kupuna would call descend lauka ye ye lauka pala pide me laui oka descend and give us inspiration, and that's what we look for, yeah, today. That kind of inspiration. So when we start the ethnography, where do we start? Uh, I'm a very simple-minded person. I like to start at the beginning of the story. So when we're researching, we go to the oldest Hawaiian language accounts. Uh, even if they weren't chronologically written earlier than some, those that describe a landscape in that period prior to Western contact, in a time when Kupuna said the Akua, the gods themselves still walk the earth, sometimes in mortal form, you know, and they engage with humanity, with the Kanaka. And that engagement could be life giving or life snatching, depending on our, on humanity's response. And, and attitude, you might say, yeah? And so we start at the beginning, but our, our focus is always looking at Hawaiian language materials first. I mean, no offense to anyone, we don't want to always just regurgitate what some other reader, writer, excuse me, who may look a little bit like me, uh, had to say about what they think the Hawaiians were saying. Why not have the Hawaiians tell us their experience, their values, their, their way of life and living upon the landscape? So we start there with those earliest accounts, but they also recognized the island was born. You know, here we have, you know, Maui, we have a, a child of Papa. Uh, and how, uh, Papa or how mea nui hanau wa wa and wa kea, that this island, Maui, is born, you might say, geologically, from the, the uh, floor of the ocean, 18,000 feet, just to get to the shoreline. And then haleakala, you know, kau mai iluna me kahano hano. Yeah, imagine that work and then how life got here. So we take a look a little bit at, at this environment and then when the Hawaiians those kupuna braved an ocean when, when Europeans were afraid to get out of sight of land uh, because they thought they were going to fall off the end of the earth. Uh, the Hawaiians were traversing thousands of miles of open ocean and they settled, they brought with them some things that were important to them, to, to their lives, to sustain them. 
but they found a landscape that was very different, settling typically along those windward watered shorelines, more along the Bay Areas first, and then as the population expanded, moving towards the Kona or leeward sides and into the, the other more remote valleys. Um, we, we, we go through examples of that history to the best of our ability. Then we found find this wonderful, albeit sometimes very prejudiced, I could say racist, uh, very colonial, uh, very extractive experience uh, that, that came with facets of the Western occupation and the changes. So they viewed things, the Western eye viewed the landscape differently. Typically it was what we can get out of it. So it became from su sustainability, subsistence, but it wasn't just, you know, eking out a little, uh, a little, you know, enough so I can eat today and now I got to worry what I go for. for the Hawaiians. They, there was bounty, uh, but it went from that kind of subsistence to sustainable living to one that was economically driven. How much more can I get? You know, more is always better apparently. And so we gather those stories, the earliest writings. And then in 1848, uh, a radical change is finally codified in the Hawaiian kingdom. Kamehameha III under the tutelage of his Western teachers uh, promulgates the, the, the Mahele. And he and some 250 chiefs and, and foreigners among them divvy up lands, um, vast ahupua, in fact, peyahi, would have actually, was originally claimed by a chief uh, of the Kiave Almahi, Kiave lineage by the name of Kinimaka. Kinimaka claimed it, but he relinquished it in order to keep other aina that he wanted. And uh, that means that in 1848-49, by this time with the relinquishing of Kinimaka's interests in the Aina, um, there were Hoa Aina native tenants, about 15 or 16 that we can clearly identify in the original records of the Mahebe. Um, we, we find that Kinimaka relinquishes and an old time uh, foreign resident friend of the kingdom, uh, uh, Swinton uh, applies for the lower half in 1848-49, the lower half of Peahi. He's awarded it in a grant, and he's already by 1850 got 40 acres of sugarcane planted there. So looking at a way how to expand an economic revenue along with the cattle, his land is being cleared and opened up by 18, late 1850. He has the upper half of Peahi, the entire Ahupua except for about 10 native tenants who were able to file claims. Of course, not all 10 were awarded, but it's from those 10 claimants and those in the adjoining lands that we learn about Hawaiian residency and practices that Ie Ie grew down to not below, not far below the, the road area, the old Alanui Aupuni, uh, towards the, the conservancy property, what is now the conservancy property. Uh, Swinton was land rich, apparently not extremely savvy economically. And before, by the end of 1850, he'd already lost, he was bankrupt. And uh, uh, Anthon, uh, who had another foreigner, a French consul who had purchased neighboring Aina, bought out the, the interests of Swinton. And they held the land up really until the late 1880s but Anthony had passed away. But through all of this, we find all these stories of land use, of trails, of travel, of, of cultivative uh, cultivars and really interesting things. Wauke, Olona, uh, the Ie Ie, Kalo, Uwala, you know, sweet potatoes, these kinds of things. Fascinating histories that tell us, you are right. When, when William described finding the landscape uh, and that he had a really hard time of uh, getting natives to grow. It had been so stripped, so denuded, that that was a challenge. Um, amazingly, 
shortly after the Mahele because it failed Hawaiians, ultimately the Hoa Aina, the native tenants. Hui Aina, uh, land associations were formed by Hawaiians um, as a means of getting Hawaiians back onto large tracts of land. And in 1888, 89, Moke Kaiapo purchases the Anthon estate interests of Peahi. And interestingly, James Campbell fronts him on this of Eva fame and a few other fames. And um, uh, within two years, Moke Kaheapo has sold 191 interest shares in what is the Hui Kuai Aino Peahi. And so the whole goal, we translated a wonderful native language account from the 1890s in which uh, the authors, the native author, authors of the account said, why should Hawaiians, why should we Hawaiians also not benefit and be benefit like the foreigners? They can buy our land, they can grow, they, they can make it economically viable for them and feed their families and, and create interest for them. They said, why, can I, why can't we do it also? So that was the, the impetus for this hui, to create something that will give Hawaiians the chance to have aina. Anyway, you know, so this is how the story goes. Then we go on up through, through you know, as I said, start at the beginning, and we chronologically just go up through whatever we can find, whether there are, fortunately, the Library of Congress has, and Ulukau, and, and uh, you know, we've digitized all the Mahele, all the Boundary Commission, all the Royal Patent Grants, you know, and you can go to these various resources and find this amazing wealth of information. What takes time is going through it page by page. But we, that's what we've been doing for over 45 years. We, we were bright enough when we were just out of our teens to start indexing everything we saw. And so, so we end up with, you know, what a 350 page short story of Peahi. Right. I love that rooting the, the, the narrative and the research in the pre-human history of, of this place and the geological history and, and the sequence of stories that you wove together all the way up through the present day, even from continuing on from the narrative you just shared all the way up through, I guess, the Mahele, all the way up through um, just our custodianship yeah. of the land was a really interesting thing for us to see too. Sure. Well, you see, one of the interesting things that, that uh, you showed during your presentation was Mariah Naopu'u's uh, yeah, Naopu, Naopua, Naopu's uh, uh, hui parcel. That hui parcel, which and, and others, which are part of the Merwin Conservancy, were connected directly to the failure of the Mahele and Pei to, to provide Hawaiians with Aina, then the hui, the evolution of the hui. But as we know, the hui in 1926, which is why it had Kuneva and a few others, in it, but it was a basically equity deed. Lawsuit had been brought, um, and I'll, I'll avoid those discussions now, but lawsuit had been brought to shut down the hui and just give everyone their right to act individually as individual landowners versus as a part of a hui. See, the hui did control that. It tried to, and so the issues began to arise because other parties became interested in access to, to land, to water, uh, to pineapple was a big deal. Well, it tried to be a big deal and uh, as an example, and that's what led to a lot of the strip, basically the clearing of a vast acre, acreage uh, following the clearing of forest and the clearing of the lowland vegetation, you know, just uh, there's a really interesting, oh, Kea'a'i as an example, you know, while we don't have a specific, and some of it say Kealii, but it's often written in the earlier accounts as Kealii Nui or Kealii Iki. Is it describing that this land, that that region, you know, one time had the, the endemic Sapodaceae, Dodonea, uh, uh, as a predominant plant there? Because we find that often through other places in the islands where a predominant plant lends its name to. Is Peahi 
a particular fern similar to what we would call Lawai today, except Lawai is a 1920s, if I recall, Southeast Asian introduction. The, the Peahi is endemic and very critically uh, ha habitat related. <laughs> What were uh, some of the other things that really stand out to you? I know that uh, one of the wonderful things that we carried forward was more of a knowledge of um, some of the sites around the three Hui parcels that then in turn became individually owned and then passed through. And I know you did a lot of sleuthing to find each one of those three Hui parcels that then fell into private yes. ownership and then eventually yes, came together. Yeah. You know, that's a, a challenging question for me because my, my problem is Onaun and I, we are fascinated by all of our history. But for me, the biggest takeaway, but this is everywhere we work across the Pai Aina, that history and knowledge has survived the passing of time. When you look at the impacts on the population, you know, uh, it is a miracle. But there is those expressions of the love of the land. I think it's the poetry, I have to say it, you know, it is the Hawaiian poetry and in, in the Hawaiian mind, you know, when you have those, uh, and, you know, while I'm not proficient, while you have language skills, those words create an imagery. And I'm sure just like when you were reading William's you know, uh, poem about his experience in trying, I think that that created an image in everyone's mind. Well, Hawaiian words are more than just words. They create those images also, you know? Um, those were the treasures. And what we believe, yeah, is that this research just, skims the surface, but with this body of work, we have, and I noticed that Janet Six as an example uh, logged in earlier. Um, we have the opportunity with Janet and others to begin community ethnography, community archeology, span to really go in there and try to document each aspect of the landscape but you know, on Lanai, when we were doing these programs with, with children, we were teaching them plain table mapping. They, like me, geometry you know, means nothing to me. It's just not my brain set, right? But you get them in the field and they, they get it. And this is how we will be able to further document. Land is a library, as Gag Gabby said. That land is a library that is still waiting to, to share its story. I hesitate to say to be opened because uh, a Western mind, you know, Indiana Jones pickaxe and come in, you know, you know, we're not talking about digging it all up, but we're talking about understanding what the landscape is today and how those changes have occurred. But now it also gives us a point to be able to document transitions, changes. And are those changes positive or uh, are they impacting what's left of the fragile ecosystem and, and environment, culture, biocultural landscape? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, in a lot of ways, it's a really beautiful segue to sharing a bit about what we're carrying forward as stewards now. Um, returning to the wellspring, perhaps is the better metaphor for the land because it is it is uh, bottomless it is limitless in terms yes. of the stories it holds and stories that aren't necessarily in in forms of obviously of language or even of objects um so it's it's a real privilege to be able to be in that space of learning from it indefinitely and i think that has a lot to do with the reciprocal relationships that of course are all throughout the history of of relation well they're very uh, inseparable as you said right um so I, maybe I'll share a few of the ways that we're building on um, the study that you conducted for us. And, and Hi, brought us Mahalo. If I may, one thing before we go, 
ena makama kaaloha ka mea mai ka i mālama, ka mea meke ori hopakawa ni aku. In the hewa wau, maka i anaku uaha, hui kala mai api. I ask all of you, our friends and, and associates, uh, keep the good, set the bad aside if there was something I said that was offensive, not meant to be, but you know, history is not a sanitized artifact either. There is all sorts of facets to it. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo ke pa. Just, I thought maybe I'd just pull a, a few of those threads forward to share with you um, some of the ways that we're really building on this concurrently. And as I said earlier, this idea of of place literacy is an idea that the garden itself is born of, of, um, of William's fluency, a place that he gained from doing a lot of what we now have done. It's really stunning to see the kinds of connections that he himself made in the archival materials that we're finding. So we're learning from what he found and learned about as well and moving forward. Um, but this idea of our becoming more uh, fluent in the place that we have come to, to, to steward, it's meaningful, of course, both in and of itself but also as something that we could share with others. That's a notion of becoming familiar with one's home place um, that is, can be carried forward into other, um, other people's relationship to places they call home or places that are special for them. And this is an area that we really are interested in building around school partnerships, around um, a curriculum of some kind. Over time, uh, the notion of becoming attentive to all the aspects of place. I just see in the chat that it was indeed extraordinary. That was our experience over the past year and a half is, is learning from k and um, being captivated by his storytelling, so I agree. Uh, another thing that I'm sure you've now heard many times, but is really something we've taken to heart, is this idea of an unfolding story of place and an inclusive story of place. And of course, um, the, the, the focus, the, the, um, the frame that the Conservancy approaches the land from initially, of course, is the chapter that relates to William's experience with that, but that's by no means bound in time. So one of the things that we're doing is who was present before, what were the stories, the histories before, as we've been talking about, that get woven into that chapter. The story began well before William arrived, and the story will continue through the Conservancy long afterward. And that notion of continuity and unfolding of place is one that we're really keeping in mind in terms of our storytelling and the experience, the interpretive experience that we share with others who come here. Um, probably one that I'm most excited about is the richness of this material that's been gathered as a creative springboard. And as k said earlier, in terms of others' research um, of other art forms that might build on this. Certainly the, the refrain in the melee that are gathered in this study that have to do with the rain in the hollow tree and, and many of the other beautiful uh, poetic references in the language just offer up all kinds of opportunities for others to create and help us build on that history in new ways. Um, in another really concrete way in which this study will remain with us is when we consider what will the expansion of the garden look like. There were a few acres on the property that William did not yet plant out. And so knowing what the weather patterns were historically, knowing what was growing there, as Kepa mentioned earlier, but to have the account of major changes in weather over the past hundreds of years is a very valuable tool for us as we consider the future of the garden and other things that we might build there. Just concretely, and I'm really excited to bring my colleague Sarah into the conversation too, because she was a, an integral partner in this whole project with me and with Kepa and Aona. Oh, and Aona. Here's Sarah, hi Sarah. Hi. Um, to share some of the programming that we're developing directly out of the findings of the study. Sarah, do you wanna share a little bit about that? Sure, sure, we are. Uh, continuing to add to our library, uh, in a sense, as if we don't have enough of a library, as you can see behind Sonnet. Um, we're adding to our library um, and also kind of a nod to that Olelo no Yao that Kepa brought up about how not, not all knowledge is found in one school. 
So the ethnohistorical study is based on primary, primary source documents. Uh, and we're happy to announce a new way um, that we're going to engage in place-based storytelling. We're calling it Peahi Stories. And it's a storytelling initiative that will further our commitment to place literacy by inviting um, kupuna and hist local historians to gather on the land to talk story and will record conversations about the mo'olalo that they carry. Um, and this is all um, funded in part by a generous grant from the Hawaii Council for the Humanities through the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, so in addition to gathering the stories on the land, we'll also take bite-sized kind of digestible, um, I'll call them nuggets from the ethnohistorical study of the 350 pages that it's very difficult to read through uh, in a, at a glance, but we'll borrow uh, wonderful stories from there and from those we gather on the land and start a blog series, uh, kind of multimedia blog series on our website, again, called Peahi Stories. And that will start in 2022. Um, basically as a way to um, add a more informal and even more inclusive approach to telling the story of place and further developing our place literacy and sharing it publicly. Um, and that's, I'm really excited about the potential for that to continue to grow. You can imagine a blog post with a particular story being shared and then um, the echoes and the contributions that can come uh, in the comments and, and through sharing those stories digitally. Um, so this is a really, um, this ethno-historical study gave us so many ideas about how to continue engaging with the place and with our neighbors. So I hope if there's anyone listening who knows Mo'olelo connected to Piahi, um, we would love to invite you to be a part of this, these talk story gatherings next year. They'll happen quarterly on the land at the Conservancy. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, of course, Kate Pa, um, for, for joining me and just sharing just a tiny little slice of what we learned and what we are continuing to learn about in the study. Um, and again, just reiterate how grateful we feel to be able to move into this new chapter as the new stewards of this place, um, looking back and looking forward. Andrea, do you, would you like to um, maybe bring some questions in if there are any? Sure, I just want to mahalo everyone. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary and, and I think we have several questions and I encourage people who are joining us right now, if you have additional questions um, to put them in the chat and we will, we'll, okay, okay, we, I see one. Um, from Nancy, we had a question about, are there any old maps that show the location of the low E? So, Kipa. Yeah, you know, uh, unfortunately, in our review of work, we did not find maps of those details. What does help us is, are the claims of the Mahele, uh, even if the, and this part of the problem is, is more claims were made than were awarded. So then we look at the claims and we get an idea of this place name is here. If the award wasn't made, was another neighboring award made? So we start to at least get an idea of where the Lo'i might have been, uh, but also recognize that by the time of the Mahele, the population had dropped uh, was Maui's population by that time was, I think, less than 30,000 people by 1848. Uh, Hawaii Island had the largest at around 50. You know, uh, you know, so much had been lost. So this is a part of why that work will be very helpful if we can get those field schools in, engaged and, you know, who are these community learning projects. Short answer, I'm sorry, no specific maps of Lo'i areas uh, that I recall in Peahe. Thank you. Thank you, mahalo Kepa. Um, just brings me to the question and you, you address this sonnet, obviously with the work and the, the way that this study has kind of broadened and deepened, of course, the view of the land and, and the history of the land and that has in the present day created this, as you called it, creative springboard. 
And I'm just wondering, Kepa, also from all the work that you and Anana have done over the years, that how, can you just share for other places, what are some of the ways that these types of studies are really helping to preserve places, um, engage more people in their communities, and more to tell the stories? Thank you. Is it, if, if I may, I'm going to just give you our website, kumupono.com. Onana's been completely updated. We now have, you know, uh, perhaps 50 of our ethnographic studies, which cover all of the Hawaiian islands uh, on now, and we're still adding. So kumupono.com, and they're just up there for free. How do they influence our, much of our work has been done for communities across the Pai Aina. Um, because communities are hungry to understand their history. You know, there's a very important, when I was sitting down with Tutu Kavena Pukui at one point, I asked her, you know, Tutu, pay or lo akele no fragments of Hawaiian history. I, you know, cause she's, you know, translated this John Papai'i's work and he was writing in the 1860s, uh, 70. And, uh, she's ah he himself called his his history fragments of Hawaiian history. So those fragments are so important. And the better we understand the fragments of those history and how they've been perpetuated or preserved, passed on, and lived through the present day, the stronger our communities are and being able to offer voices that inspire wise use. And this is what we're looking at. You know, uh, families, you know, we've interviewed, as, as Sonnet mentioned, you know, we, we've interviewed, got over a thousand oral history interviews with kupuna and elder kama'aina. So not only old time Hawaiians, but other of the mixed ethnicities that have made Hawaii home, whether they're missionary descendants or off the boat from, from the Philippines or wherever, right? They, they've all contributed to our history. They pass away and we still, we regularly get calls from Ohana saying, I didn't know my kupuna or my auntie, uncle knew these kinds of things. That's what it's about. We're trying to ensure that the history remains in the communities and then it will help us make informed decisions. One can pray, you know. Mm, thank you so much for that, Kapa. It just strike me. Um, there's a couple of other questions. Someone, um, Cortland was asking if it's possible, I don't know if this study is public, but if it was possible to get a copy of the study. I know we'll be sharing, as Sarah mentioned, um, sort of pieces uh, throughout the Piahi stories throughout the next year, really be sharing that and um, creating, Sarah, some resources that would be shareable from it as well, right? Yeah, I would recommend um, if, if you want to receive those in your inbox, um, subscribing to our newsletter, um, I can put a, a link in the chat for that and then you'll you'll be the first to receive them, receive them as they're published. Thank you. Um, I, there also will be a survey at the end, which I don't think I mentioned. So in that survey, I've invited people who are interested in either of our organizations work to put their email address so that they can be added to our respective email lists. Thank you. Um, Deborah Ward asked, how can I research just the history oh, of land my grandma inherited from her Nahanite uncle and aunt in Keaki? I'm not sure. Kippa, did you hear that? <laughs> yes, I did. I'm sorry. I was oh, also you. trying to, I see Kel Ethone and I believe uh, Onauna shares familial. Uh, I can see her. Well, well, relationships with that. Okay. Anyway, um, for, for, for Deborah's uh, question, we always, one of the other things we didn't mention, but Sarah, uh, excuse me, Sonnet alluded to it. Because of COVID, and our own need to be cautious about what we expose ourselves personally to, we were unable to get to the Bureau of Conveyances. But fortunately, and because, you know, you travel from off island there, they give you 45 minutes if you're lucky, oh, you know, waste the whole air flight, air flight and everything right now. So, so we went through all of the native and the Hawaii-based newspapers and pulled out probably 150 or so records of conveyance of land. 
So, so, so Debbie, Deborah, what I would say is when you can get to the Bureau of Conveyances, I would simply go and look for those Kupuna names. And uh, if you know where they are, so if you know that they're on Hamakualoa, if they are at Peahi, it's the indices of um, grantees and grantors. Uh, just look up the name and you'll start to find those connections. And from there in the tax records and various things, but the Bureau of Conveyances will give you those kinds of, of records. So um, uh, that's one way to do it. You know, I think I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, Kepa. Um, Sonnet or Sarah, did you wanna follow any of those previous question threads or have anything to add before I, I pull out another question? Okay, um, let's see. Sorry, Andrea, I was on mute. Could I share just one reflection? Oh, yes, please. Just looking at the, the chat, it's so moving to me to see the kinds of questions that people have about their own sense of kuleana and their own interest in, in exploring similar reaches back into the past. So I just wanted to mention that if you haven't been keeping an eye on the chat, it's worth doing that. It's quite a, quite a moving read. <laughs> Will we, forgive me, will we be able to get a copy of the chat so that I can respond to, to individuals? Thank you yeah. so much. Sorry, yeah, I'm absolutely. terrible at watching that and watching this. So it's like- Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, there's a lot going on. It's, yeah. it's always challenging. Um, Sonnet, can you, or Sonnet or Sarah or both, can you, can you maybe say a little more um, about just the process you underwent before you maybe decided to pursue the ethno-historical study and what led you to choose that or was, and I hope I didn't miss that earlier. I was just curious about that. <laughs> there, there were several pathways to this, um, to this study. I think all arrows pointed toward it and we followed those. Uh, I'll share a few and then I know Sarah has some as well to, to weave into our decision to, to do this. Um, you know, a lot of what we were finding in the house over the past year was really uh, at least deepening my knowledge about William's deep investment in so many aspects of this place that he had come to call home. And again, as, as people who are now custodians of land and also of a legacy, it felt beholden on, I mean, we felt that to carry forward the, the cultural and ecological integrity of everything that William had begun, began there meant ourselves doing this kind of work. Um, I think also just the pure serendipity of stumbling across those um, audio recordings of, of K. Pa's conversation with William was another sign to point us in that direction. And then in the course of our interpretive planning, which I mentioned was a number of things, was a weaving together everything we found archivally and also community conversations that were structured and oral history interviews that we conducted with people that knew William well, who, who knew William well. Um, Sarah had a, a conversation in that process that really turned us fully toward this. Sarah, do you wanna share a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so we were working to um, connect with our neighbors, um, not just those on our street, but those in the in the Haiku area. And I reached out to uh, the Po'o of the Ahumoku Council for um, for Hamakualoa, and that is a woman, a wonderful woman na named Jocelyn Costa. And uh, I was in a conversation with her, just saying, "Hey, you know, would you help?" gather together folks so we can do some oral histories and, and, and ask some questions and learn. And um, she just helped us identify that our knowledge of place needed to deepen uh, before we considered programmatic activities. And of course we were in the process of that, but she um, made a major light bulb go off for us that we should engage in this. Um, we also walked the property with um, my dear friend, Janet Six, and, and you know learned a bit from her just through that walk. And it just became really clear that we needed to um, dig really, really deep into the past. And, and Kepa was obviously the perfect person to work with for that. Thank you so much. Um, just looking to see if there are additional 
questions? I think there's so many things that I'm wanting to ask, but it's it was so rich, the conversation, I can't quite process everything right now. Um, most importantly, Kepam and, and Sanad and Sarah, I'm hoping this will be an inspiration for others in other communities who are stewarding places and will think about the various tools and various resources and various histories that they'll be able to pull together and, and work together to share. Because this has been, um, I, I think, I guess the, the last thing, um, well, somebody had, forgive me, I think there was one question if someone can answer, which was, I think that was a question from Nancy McPherson. Will any water be returned to Payahi Stream as an outcome of the East Maui Irrigation County decision? I'm not sure if someone can, has an answer to that or, and if not, that's okay. We Maybe we can respond to that later. Yeah, no? I don't think that I would be I don't have enough knowledge of the current discussions to know. Um, I, I don't either. We, our particular stream is not part of the contested case. Um, okay. So it could set a precedent and, and could precipitate like water uh, to our stream. One can hope. Great. I guess the last question is somebody wanted to find, wanted to find out how they might visit or volunteer um, with the Mormon Conservancy. I love seeing that. I think it's, that Sarah might have put in the chat a little bit earlier how to subscribe to our newsletter or how to just reach out to us at info at merwinconservancy.org and we'd love to, to talk with you. We're just about to start a volunteer program on the land. We've had a number of volunteers helping us with these books behind me over the past years and now we're excited to build on that and bring people to help volunteer in the garden. So please do reach out. You can also um, visit as a part of our Open Garden Days program, um, which also you can sign up for that on our website. Um, we have a monthly day where we open the garden for two small groups. And I have the pleasure of leading those groups um, through the property. So I hope to see you there. May I just add one thing? Absolutely. Sarah, you brought up a really important uh, mm -hmm. reminder about, you know, the water and the flow and, you know, perhaps that it might happen. Recognizing there was a reason that Ahuwa'a ran from mountaintops and some of them over the mountain to the other side, out to the ocean. It becomes very, very difficult for us to create restoration and what is that, what period of time, what are we restoring to, yeah? But very important questions and discussions to be had, but it needs to be an Ahuwa approach because water flowing in Peahi stream was probably not like Onomanu and other, you know, Wailua and, and you know, the Ke'anai, you know, and, and uh, these, of Iau, Wai Kapu, you know, just very, very different, right? right? And so if we don't have an Ahua approach to restoration, Mauka to Mokai, you know, we can do a restoration of the landscape that will at least bring things back within um, the ecology of that Kula zone. I'm not talking about Kula Maui. I'm talking about Kula parcel of land zone to get the right kind of plants and things going. And as we know, hahai no kaulu yes, rains follow the forest. The moment if we can get rid of you know some of the crap that was purposely introduced, um, forgive me, uh, but it it just sucks it up. You know, like guava, everything. Oh, why be? It's great because you know it's just green and it's cool. To, it sucks up and, and hardens the soil. You lose more than you do almost if it had just been barren earth. So anyway, it's a big story. So the conservancy and many other community organizations in our state and counties, you know, olaka aina olake kanaka olake kaya ulu. If the land is healthy, the people are healthy, the community is healthy, and guess what? Business can be healthy too, but it needs to be a kako thing. 
Thank you so much, Kepa. Forgive me. I think that's such a beautiful way to draw a close to this wonderful conversation. And I just really want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to mahalo again, mahalo nui loa to Sonnet, Kepa and Sarah, and of course, Anauna, who's there with you. Yes. Um, <laughs> I saw her for a moment. There was a little round. <laughs> that was cute. Thank you so much for sharing this really amazing mana'o this evening with us. Um, I would again want to just remind everyone if you would be so kind as to complete the short survey that will pop up when you log out. It's really helpful to both our organizations to help us continue with our work. And um, please visit historichawaii.org if you would like to support HHF and our work. And Merwin Conservancy put their website into the chat earlier. You can also please reach out. They have a program tomorrow, which I just registered for. Um, did you want to say quickly, Sarah, since you're online? It's um it's Thursday. So I Oh Thursday, you. sorry. <laughs> yeah, Thursday <laughs> night we have um the last green room of the year. We have an uh, arts and ecology event series called the green room and it's live online and uh we're featuring the wonderful pulitzer prize winning poet natalie diaz uh who will be with us read um, kepa's study <laughs> that's, read the study that's <laughs> so study. cool yeah so the thread thank you <laughs> thank, thank you so you much Andrea, for bringing us together i really really appreciate uh, it. I love it. of course it's our pleasure um i want to thank everyone who's still with us uh, uh, in the audience, and I'd like to thank my my coworker Michelle Kisik, who has been providing technical and event support. And I want to wish everyone, all of you, all of your loved ones, Mele Kuiki Maka. I also want to wish the brightest blessings of the solstice, which is coming up, and how Oli Makahiki how, and just thank you so much for for being you and for doing what you do, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Bye-bye. Mahalo. Aholiho. Bye.